is a shockingly impressive turnout. It is with great pleasure that I introduce the poet Thomas Lux. Thomas Lux is the author, <coughs> excuse me, is the author of 10 wonderful collections of poetry. The most recent is called Cradle Place and is, will be, sold in the back of the room. His total number of books is a whopping 16. He has received numerous awards, including being a finalist for the Lenore Marshall Poetry Prize, a winner of the Kinsley Tufts Poetry Award and the Los Angeles Times Book Award in Poetry. Um, he has also received three National Endowments for the Arts grants and a Guggenheim Fellowship. What this all means, if you're not familiar with these awards, is that Mr. Lux is a major and important contemporary voice in poetry. Uh, Mr. Lux's work has been called witty, hard to classify, and easy to enjoy. What I love most about his work is its wild, sometimes surreal imaginings. To give you a sense of this, here's just a taste of some of Lux's titles for his poems. Number one, Boatloads of Mummies. <laughs> Number two, Debate Regarding the Permissibility of Eating Mermaids. You can laugh, this is okay. <laughs> Three Vials of Maggots, and a personal fav favorite, Tarantulas on the Life Buoy. Thomas's work is a poetry that lives in surprising places, but then, surprisingly, these places become familiar. And as a reader, I realize I actually know this vial of maggots personally, <laughs> or this tarantula-laden buoy. In the poem, Beneath the Apple Branches, branches Bent Dumbly, the speaker says he, and the grass he is lying on, are, quote, completely alive with one thought. This seems to me to sum up the attraction to Lux's work. This is an author completely alive, someone who is truly looking at the world, its idiosyncratic connections, its unreal realities, its stumbling stupidity, its blind hope. Now, I could leave you with the voices of many critics who have praised his work extensively, but I would far rather quote my own students. So, in the words of my students, um, though I'm not usually a fan of contemporary poems, I find that I am really loving this man's work. <laughs> or, I enjoy the sense of macabre in his tone. <laughs> the poems made a mark on the soul. He's unique, he's clever, he's a little bit eccentric. <laughs> <laughs> and in the words of one final student, cool. <laughs> so, with pleasure, Tom Lux. <laughs> wow. Thank, thank you, Suzanne. That was a really thoughtful and generous introduction. Thank you. Uh, whoever wrote that, cool. Could I use that as a, as a quote on my new book? Uh, whoever wrote that, uh, let me know later and uh, give me your name and I'll just put that on the back of my... Sure. That really does mean more to me, uh, hearing uh, things like that, comments like that from uh, uh, students, uh, people maybe who are fairly new to poetry, uh, than, than you know, regular poetry critics do. That really means a lot to me. That, that matters. One writes poems to try to make some kind of connection with, with, other, with other people. It's something you do mostly solitary, in solitude. And you don't get a lot of feedback uh, on it. You don't, uh, you don't really know uh, if people are even seeing or, or reading uh, the poem. So uh, when I hear that young people in particular uh, like my poems or they're used in schools or something, uh, that's really cool uh, to me. And I'm going to read some of the poems. I'm going to get this a little steadier somehow. Although I guess that's probably not going to work. Oh, where'd that come from? I need that. Oh. <laughs> but I mean, I would have been up here going nuts looking for that. Do I need to stand right in front of this for you to hear me? In the back? OK. Raise it up. Raise it up a little. Yeah, that's OK. I'm going to read some of the uh, poems that, uh, that you've been using in, in uh, Suzanne's class here. And different uh, students at the little dinner we had beforehand uh, uh, suggested these, uh, these first several poems anyway. This one's called, <coughs> excuse me, Tactile. It's a love poem. Tactile. One eyelash, one millimeter longer than each 
other eyelash on your left eyelid bends at its tip as it alone leans on my lowest left ribs ledge. This single filament holding your bones to mine. A touch of no touch, a touch so light the tactile scales needle barely breathes. Then, attached to a human as it is, this one eyelash lashes me there many times. And tonight, the tiny scars shine in the blue stone dark. Uh, I forgot to mention, I brought a, uh, I brought a friend along tonight. I've been doing this uh, occasionally recently, uh, younger poets, uh, some, usually poets who've been students of mine, and I bring them along to readings and, uh, and call them up to read a couple of poems. And I brought a young poet named Ron Egatz who went through the Sarah Lawrence program. So I'm going to read three or four more poems. I'm going to call him up here and he's going to read uh, 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 three poems, I think, and then I'll come up and, and, and read again. Uh, a little bit more. So another poem that no one has ever asked me to read this poem before, called Three Vials of Maggots. Uh, no one has ever uh, uh, <laughs> requested this poem before. Where does that kid go? This kid with the weird, weird hair there. <laughs> Three Vials of Maggots. Three vials of maggots were collected from the corpse found lying in a field near a small stream. From these, the lab can tell at what time the dead one died. They have schedules, the flies. Some lay eggs, which hatch to maggots, which consume the corpse. Others come to eat flies, maggots, eggs. Hide beetles arrive to clean the gristle. It's an orderly arrangement. What the maggots do, they do for you. Weird, weird kid, right? What do we cross? Here's another one. Another. Uh, I don't think anybody ever asked me to read this one uh, either. It's called Scorpions Everywhere. It's probably a poem about uh, uh, paranoia. The speaker of this poem. This is more of a persona poem. This, most of the poems are sort of spoken by one guy, not necessarily me. Uh, but yeah, it is me. But this guy is a, a, a speaker, like a character uh, in, would be in a, in a novel or a short story. Scorpions uh, everywhere. There goes one disguised as a mouse. And those gray fellows, bushy tails who jump from tree to roof to fence. Watch their eyes as they watch you while they eat their nuts. They are everywhere now, and to their cousins, the white-tailed browsers. Bambi is a baby of their species name, who eat our suburbs shrubs and herbs. And those that purr, and those mouth breathers, drooling woofers, and the ones with bandit eyes who trash the trash, all of these creatures, and to their spawn, are not as they seem. Do not more and more of them move closer and closer? Do you look out the window and see two? Do you turn away, turn back, see three? Do you hear the little brother of the wolf howling from the marsh grass near the golf course, the eighth tee? He leads them all, quick, cunning, and assisted by his minister, a gnat. Each is, in fact, this is certain, a scorpion and holds a vial of venom until it's time to inject in you. Oh, on the day the wind is wrecked, on the day the sky breaks, on the day the sea creeps under a rock. It's about you know somebody who sees uh, things that aren't really there, starts worrying, exaggerating things that uh, aren't really there. This one's called Rather. Now it ends, uh, it ends with a kind of gimmick. Uh, 
uh, uh, something that's only visual on the page, so I have to uh, explain it to you. But the poem ends, there's a colon, and then there's a blank space and a period. And that blank space is supposed to represent nothingness, uh, lack of being, uh, another word for which would be uh, death. Uh, it's called rather. It's all one sentence. Uh, it's only about 30 lines long, but it's all one sentence. It's a list, uh, so I have to kind of uh, take a big breath and, and, uh, and get, get through the whole thing without stopping or, or slowing down. Uh, rather. All these things this guy would rather do than be dead. Rather strapped face to face with a corpse. Rather an asp forced down my throat. Rather a glass tube inserted in my urethra and then member smashed with a hammer. Rather wander the malls of America shopping for shoes. <laughs> rather be lunch from the ankles down for a fish, rather mistake rabbit drops for capers or pearls, rather my father's bones crushed to dust and blown, blinding me in my eyes, rather a flash flood of liquid mud, boulders, branches, drown dogs, tear through boys town and grind up a thousand orphans, rather Finger puppets with ice picks probe me. Rather numbness. Rather Malaysian tongue worm. Rather rue. Rather a starved rat tied by his tail to my last tooth. Rather memory become mush. Rather no more books be written but on the sole subject of self. Rather a retinal tattoo. Rather, buckets of bad bacilli and nothing else to drink. Rather, the blather at an English department meeting. <laughs> Rather, a mountain fall on my head than this, what I put down here. Rather, all of the above than this, this, colon, dash, or blank space, period. The guy is saying anything's better than being dead. I'll read one more, and then I'm going to ask uh, Ronnie to come up. Uh, I was saying, somebody asked me, the, one of the guys from the uh, paper, uh, school paper here asked me, what's, uh, what was like the coolest thing or the best thing that ever happened to you as a writer? And, uh, and I said it was just last spring uh, when this poem uh, was on the subways in New York. They have this thing, uh, and buses too, I guess, uh, called Poetry in Motion. And, uh, you know, on New York subways up there, Dr. Z, the skin doctor, he's all over the subways, and then the orthodontist and stuff, they have poems up there, uh, too. And they get seen by people who never read uh, poems and uh, on their way to work, uh, tired, or, uh, uh, and they get seen by people. And you get a, I got a lot of uh, feedback uh, from, from people uh, I, I never would have, uh, who never would have read my, my poem before. Uh, that was the coolest thing that happened to me in, in a long time. Uh, gotten nice things and even get money once in a while and grants and stuff like that. But uh, <coughs> I think what writers want more than anything is to be read, to have, uh, to have readers. Uh, that's at least the import most important thing to me. The poem is called The Little Tooth. Uh, it's, a, it's, in a, it's rhymed and metered. Uh, it's only a nine line poem. It's about my daughter. I wrote it shortly after her birth or when she was two or three. She's now 20, a junior in college, and, uh, and, and a lot of the things I predict uh, uh, about her in this poem uh, come true, <laughs> come true, uh, if any of you have uh, children about that age, uh, which is about your age, most of you. <laughs> a little tooth. Your baby grows a tooth, then two, and four, and five, then she wants some meat directly from the bone. It's all over. She'll learn some words. She'll fall in love with Cretans, dolts, a sweet talker on his way to jail. <laughs> and you, your wife, get old, fly blown, and rue nothing. You did, you loved, your feet are sore. It's dusk, your daughter's tall. 
This is Ron, Ron Egat's going to read three poems, I believe. Ron is a graduate of the Sarah Lawrence MFA program. He's also a publisher, a small press publisher, has a press called Camber Press. I was saying at our little dinner uh, before that that's sort of a part, or should be, and always was, part of, uh, of being a writer, being a poet in particular, is that you found ways to serve the art form other than just with your own poems. You start a magazine, you start a small press, you start uh, a reading uh, venue, you review, you translate if you can, you serve the art form. Uh, in, in some ways, and uh, other than your own poems, and that's one of the things Ron Egatz is has always uh, done. So, uh, uh, please welcome him, Ron Egatz. I'll be back. Thank you. This is uh, the first time I'm reading in my home state of New Jersey. So. Yeah. <laughs> They allowed me to come back after so long. Uh, so this poem is called Chart into Midlife Straits. It's uh, you know like on a map, uh, straits going into a delta or something like that. Am I loud enough here? Is this okay? Can you guys hear? Yeah. Chart into Midlife Straits. Your girlfriend's underwear has less surface area than a square of toilet paper. <laughs> You love her for this, among other things, but this is way up there. <laughs> then things change. Days leave you as you left other women, unconsciously or without a word, or with it being no one's fault. Days do what they want. Your heart, which got you into this, pumps less efficiently. Your hairline on the run for the back of your head. You play certain parts of your skeletal system, like percussion instruments, and bathroom trips bring more pleasure than you ever imagined. <laughs> Surgeons cut things out, you keep going. Jar lids are tighter. Your own underwear gets larger even if your waistline doesn't. Suits aren't so bad. Your life soundtrack plays just fine as instrumentals. Your parents' faces only clear in photos. Your friends reproduce with alarming regularity. But you're free, wifeless, looking back across temporal planes for the child you weren't as a boy. Better than the alternative, you cast off, your years lashed together as a raft, your massive underwear a sail for the breezes of old age, eyes fixed on the razored horizon for a hint of the man they told you you'd be. And I'm going to do two more, and then we're going to get back to the main attraction. I, uh, I used to work at the New York Times, and one of the reasons I'm not working there anymore is because I used to go down into the morgue and read all the old stuff that was printed a long time ago, and I was supposed to be working. Foolishly, they hired me for real work. But this is uh, something I found down there, and it was uh, actually from the New York Times uh, on September 13th, 1899. Uh, and it's called First Motor Vehicle Fatality in America. <laughs> it's all true. Henry Hale Bliss at Central Park West and 74th Street makes history. At 68, Bliss, no stranger to chivalry, disembar disembarks a trolley car and soon life. Well-tempered, a gentleman of fine breeding, he turns offering a hand to a certain Miss Lee. Mr. Bliss has avoided consumption, smallpox, scarlet fever, and ailments taken in association with ladies of ill repute. <laughs> Arthur Smith, background unknown, early Manhattan cabbie, allegedly swerves to avoid hitting a truck. Miss Lee becomes hysterical, her fingertips so close to Henry Hale Bliss's only a few thousand moisture molecules of New York's late summer humidity between them before he is ragdoll yanked away, his chest, his grayed head crushed, thrown to cobblestones. Perhaps Miss Lee was your mistress, Henry. Perhaps you paid for kindness to a stranger with your life. History has hid her from us. We don't even know the fate of Arthur Smith post-homicide charges. But you, Mr. Bliss, you were first and thus remembered. Number one in a line, 30 million and growing. <laughs> <laughs> and 
And uh, the last one is actually for, uh, uh, it's for nobody in particular, but it's, uh, this is something that happened with a niece of mine who lives in Montclair, New Jersey. And uh, it seemed the right thing to end with. It's called poopy head. <laughs> Poopy head is the term my niece uses for people who don't acquiesce. It's jargon of choice among the preschool set, apparently. Poopy head playmates and babysitters and plenty of poopy head teachers on the way, little Emily. <laughs> poopy head coaches and backstabbing ex-best friends. Vapid teen idols and genetic freak models with poopy head bodies. <laughs> Prom date. Virginity taker, non-committal fiancés, ex-husband, poopy heads. <laughs> poopy head landlords, preachers, and wedding reception caterers. Mid-level managers maintaining poopy head glass ceilings. Married men, non-vasectomy internet dating men. Poopy head ombudsmen, whistling construction workers, and don't forget the big one, poopy head president. <laughs> Emily, I like your melding of our waste, what's left over from fuel we put in ourselves with our minds, our beings. No, Emily, there's nothing wrong with you. All the trillions of biologic happenings inside you each night, ensuring your eyes open every morning, perfect. It's the others, Emily, it's them, poopy heads all. <laughs> That's what we taught him at Sarah Lawrence. Uh, I'm not sure I'm going to keep doing this, though. Uh, uh, there's too much of a risk of getting upstaged. <laughs> I think that might be the last time, Ronnie. <laughs> Somebody asked me to read this poem uh, called uh, Debate Regarding the Permissibility of Eating Mermaids. Now that was actually, that title actually came up, that was an actual discussion, uh, I believe it was uh, early 17th century of the British Admiralty, they had these meetings to talk about it in case you were shipwrecked or you were set adrift, whether uh, it was okay to eat a mermaid or not, uh, if you caught a mermaid. Uh, so the poem just kind of uh, riffs off of that uh, uh, title. Debate regarding the permissibility of eating mermaids. Cold water mermaids and only on Fridays, said Pope Ignace VII. Sumerian texts suggest consent if human parts predecease fishy parts, but cuneiform detailing this was lost to tomb robbers. The British Admiralty, 16th century, deemed it anthropophagy and forbade it, though castaways after 60 days were exempted upon the depletion of sea biscuits. Taboo, taboo, said the South Sea Islanders, though a man could marry one if his aquatic skills impressed her enough. Conversely, a woman, no matter how well she swam, could not marry with a merman. Uruguayans, Iowans leave no records on the subject. The Germans find it distasteful, though recently declassified World War II archives suggest certain U-boat captains, no problem for the French, flambéed or beneath Bernays. The official Chinese position is they don't have a position. But I grow weary of this dour study, tired of the books wherein this news is hidden, the creaking shelves in museum basements, the crumbling pages of the past and future. I'm tired of this foggy research to which I've devoted decades trying to find the truth in these matters and what matters in such truth. <coughs> it, it tries to turn into being a, a poem about somebody who would uh, read uh, stuff like this. Uh, some of the things in here are, 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 are real and some of them are completely made up, like they really did have this discussion. Uh, 
In fact, most of the stuff is made up. But part of the fun is, uh, in a poem like this anyway, is uh, uh, trying to make things up that, that sound like they're, they're real, uh, like they could really uh, uh, happen, uh, even, even very uh, strange things. Okay. This poem is called Refrigerator 1957. I'm thinking of the refrigerator in the house where I grew up, uh, those big old, old refrigerators. Uh, I grew up on a dairy farm in, in Massachusetts. Refrigerator, 1957. More like a vault. You pull the handle out, and on the shelves, not a lot. And what there is, a boiled potato in a bag, a chicken carcass under foil, looking dispirited, drained, mugged. This is not a place to go in hunger or hope. <laughs> but, but, just to the right of the middle of the middle door shelf, on fire, a lit from within red, heart red, sexual red, wet neon red, shining red in their liquid, exotic, slumming, aloof in such company, a jar of maraschino cherries. Three quarters full, fiery globes like strippers at a church social. <laughs> maraschino cherries, maraschino, the only foreign word I knew. Not once did I see these cherries employed, not in a drink, nor on top of a glob of ice cream, or just pop one in your mouth, not once. The same jar there through an entire childhood of dull dinners. Bald meat, pocked peas, and, see above, boiled potatoes. Maybe they came over from the old country, family heirlooms or were status symbols bought with a piece of the first paycheck from a sweatshop which beat the pig farm in Bohemia, handed down from my grandparents to my parents to be someday mine than my child's. They were beautiful. And if I never ate one, it was because I knew it might be missed or because I knew it would not be replaced. And because you do not eat that which rips your heart with joy. They were the only colorful thing, uh, not only in the refrigerator, but uh, I asked my mother not too many years ago uh, what they were doing there, what they, what are they doing with those, Why, what they ever used. And uh, <coughs> she said they, uh, she would put half of one on my grandmother's grapefruit uh, half about once a month. Uh, so it could last a long time. When that poem came out, uh, I tell people, you don't get much money for poetry, but I got about 12 jars of maraschino cherries uh, when, when that poem first came out, one of which was a giant, must have been a restaurant uh, jar of them. Uh, like this big, it was a gigantic jar of, uh, I, if anybody needs any maraschino cherries, uh, <laughs> I got plenty. Somebody asked uh, that I read this one, it's called The Swimming Pool, uh, a kind of political, uh, angry uh, poem. The Swimming Pool. All around the apartment swimming pool, the boys stare at the girls, and the girls look everywhere but the opposite of down or up. It is as it was a thousand years ago. The fat boy has it hardest. He takes the sneers, prefers the winter so he can wear his heavy pants and sweater. Today, he's here with the others. Better they are cruel to him in his presence than out. Of the five here now, three boys, two girls, one is fat, three cruel, and one, a girl, wavers to the side, all the world tearing at her. As yet she has no breasts, her friend does, and were it not for the forlorn fat boy whom she joins in taunting, she could not bear her terror, which is the terror of being him. 
Does it make her happy that she has no need right now of ingratiation, of acting fool to solve her loneliness? She doesn't seem so happy. She is like the lower middle class, that fatal group handed crumbs so they can drop a few down lower to the poor so they won't kill the rich. All around the apartment swimming pool, there is what's everywhere, forsakenness and fear, a disdain for those beneath us rather than a rage against the ones above, the exploiters, the oblivious, and unabashedly cruel. Very different tone. This is called the, the People of the Other Village. Uh, I wrote this. Uh oh. I wrote this after the the first uh, Gulf War, and when the second Gulf War started, it it started turning up again on the internet and uh, apparently, and people asking me about it and asking to reprint it and things like that. The People of the Other Village. I'm trying to balance everything here. The people of the other village hate the people of this village and would nail our hats to our heads for refusing in their presence to remove them or staple our hands to our foreheads for refusing to salute them if we did not hurt them first. Mail them packages of rats, mix their flour at night with broken glass. We do this, they do that. They peel the larynx from one of our brother's throats. We devein one of their sisters. The quicksand pits they built were good. Our amputation teams were better. We trained some birds to steal their wheat. They sent to us exploding ambassadors of peace. They do this, we do that. We canceled our sheep imports. They no longer bought our blankets. We mocked their greatest poet, and when that had no effect, we parodied the way they dance, which did cause pain, though so they in turn said our God was leprous, hairless. We do this, they do that. 10,000, 10,000 years, 10,000, 10,000 brutal, beautiful years. Uh, 10,000 years is the approximate number of years that historians, anthropologists, etc., say that we have lived in, in civilizations, uh, which has many good things to it, of course. Socks would be one thing that came out of civilization. Cheeseburgers would be another uh, good thing. Lots of good things. But of course, we all know it also includes uh, you know, just more and more sophisticated ways of killing each other. There's a series of poems in this book uh, that I published as a, a chapbook uh, many years ago. They're all 23 lines long. I'll read one of them. Uh, it's called, You Go to School to Learn. You go to school to learn to read and add, to someday make some money. It, money, makes sense. You need a better tractor, in addition to the game room, you prefer to buy your bean curd by the barrel. There's no other way to get the goods you need. Besides, it keeps people busy working for it. It's sensible, and therefore, you go to school to learn, and the teacher, having learned, gets paid to teach you how to get it. Fine. but. You're taught away from poetry or, say, dancing. That's nice, dear, but there's no dough in it. No poem ever bought a hamburger, or not too many. It's true. And so every morning it's still dark. You see them, the children, like angels, being marched off to execution or banks, their bodies luminous in headlights, going to school. School's a lot different now, I, I think, uh, than it was then. I'm going to read one more poem from this, these books and then read a few newer poems that will be out in, in another book in the spring. 
I once saw on a, on a highway overpass, a uh, very high, very inaccessible piece of graffiti that we, you know we, how you see them along highways, but this was in a particularly inaccessible spot, dangerous spot uh, for this guy to have written uh, this. And what he wrote in giant letters in spray paint on this bridge, this overpass was, I love you, sweat heart. <laughs> I love you, sweat heart. <laughs> And that's the title of this poem. <laughs> a man risked his life to write the words. A man hung upside down, an idiot friend holding his legs with spray paint to write the words on a girder 50 feet above a highway. And his beloved, the next morning, driving to work, his words are not meant to be so unique. Does she recognize his handwriting? Did he hint to her at her doorstep the night before up oh, something special, darling, tomorrow? And did he call her at work expecting her to faint with delight at his celebration of her, his passion, his risk? She will know I love her now. The world will know my love for her. A man risked his life to write the words. Love is like this at the bone, we hope. Love is like this sweetheart, all sore and dumb and dangerous, ignited, blessed, always, regardless, no exceptions, always in blazing matters like these, blessed. <coughs> now, I make fun of that guy uh, a, a little bit uh, for, for you know, being so dumb to not even know how to spell sweetheart, uh, but then the poem kind of changes his mind at the end and, and praises him uh, because he is, in fact, doing it for love. Even if it's a stupid uh, thing, he's doing it for love. Uh, a couple of times, and this has always astonished me, I think three times uh, since I've written that poem and read it uh, many times, uh, three different times people, women, have said to me, why do you just assume that it was a guy that wrote that on that bridge? And the only, the only thing I can ever think to uh, answer that is, are you fucking kidding me? <laughs> Any doubt? I mean, women do stupid things for love, too, but usually not that stupid. I think I have uh, three or four uh, poems I'll read from this new book. Uh, the new book is called, uh, going to be called God Particles, God Particles. And this poem is called The Harmonic Scalpel. I read about a new kind of scalpel that uh, surgeons use now that cuts by sound waves, cuts by, uh, it's called a harmonic uh, scalpel. Uh, if a poet runs across something like that, uh, and kind of lets it go, doesn't kind of think, what are, what are the metaphorical possibilities here? Uh, then we should start turning in our credentials, I, I think. Uh, uh, I hope other poets have the same idea to, to try to write uh, a poem with this title, but uh, I'm pretty sure I got it first. The Harmonic Scalpel. Of all the tools the surgeon holds, the knife that hums its way to where the surgeon wants to go, of all the tools, that's the best. The patient hears the tune, the anesthesia local, and is soothed. Sometimes a nurse will white on white and her nylons too will sway to it, though not the surgeon. His or her tapping toe shoe is nailed to the floor. The knife's a radiant singer, but the hand must be steady, still, the harmonic scalpel sings its way to the heart, which needs attending to. It's red, it's blue, boom, boom, boom. Above, in the operating theater's low-lit balcony, the medical students, in loose green pants and shirts, with hands learning to find the body's stress on and beneath the skin, the medical students kiss and each the other caress. I just like to think of them up there. Uh, they're watching this, and somehow the music of the harmonic scalpel uh, 
turns them on and they start making out up there in the operating uh, uh, theater. I once gave a reading at a high school and uh, it was in like a theater and they turned all the lights off and during the reading I kept hearing these sounds of pleasure and stuff and I thought Gee, these kids are digging my poetry but then they turned the lights on all of a sudden and all the kids were making out. Uh, they were crawling all over each other, they were making out. Uh, uh, and probably some other things were happening, uh, too. <laughs> I thought that was fine, though. This is called, I've been marking these with napkins. Uh, <coughs> her hat, that party on her head. Her hat, that party on her head. I saw first and only her hat. I saw neither face nor shoulder, no lawn or garden nearby, no white tablecloths, champagne flutes, or trays of treats pierced by toothpicks that fit with her hat at this place, a side street in a village in a country across a border. Looking with bad directions for a bus brought me here. Behind a rectory, a priest in his robe read a newspaper, leaning back in a chair with his bare feet on a table. I've never seen such white feet. I saw also dust, stained laundry on lines, two roosters, some sagging wires hung above. Then, on the other side of the fence, her hat rising and dropping with each step. She walked the fence's length and disappeared. She returned and walked the fence again. She was walking a circuit, Payne's little looping course. She walked slowly, and too often her head tipped forward, her eyes turned down beneath the garden, the birthday party on her head. Who is gone so long from her? Beneath the bougainvillea and lily, beneath fuchsia's little lamps, beneath the greens and yellows and blues, whose absence made her wear this hat to help but fail to let this absence go? <coughs> Never see that, that person, just her hat. Uh, we're going to have a little uh, a Q and A afterwards. So I'll, just, I'll finish with this poem, and then we'll. Uh, if you have some questions, I'd be ha happy to uh, answer them. This is called "Apology to My Neighbors for Beheading Their Duck." <laughs> First, it was an accident. I did not mean to sever his head. A book or a being superior, or capital S superior, did not command it thus. He'd gotten into the little yard we share. He stood as still as if he were made of cement, which, in fact, he was. Nevertheless, he was not meant to lose his head. So that I could lop it off, a text was not interpreted. Though he was a heterodox duck, he wore a little blue hat. This color is proscribed for a duck's hat. Otherwise, white duck, orange feet and beak, a decent duck, a cause no trouble duck. He weighed 100 pounds, weighted down your car to get him here to his new home. Without his head, he weighs five pounds less. Without his head, broken at the neck, he's a less impressive duck. But still, I had no right to take it. It belonged to him. And he needed his head, as we, as every creature does, despite the swamp, the sump, thriving inside it. He did not belong to me, nor was he of my family. When I dropped a bag, rather than carry it down to the barrels beside the duck of trash from my fourth floor back porch, that's what did it, clipped it clean off, for which I offer apologies and cash but I must reiterate, a book did not tell me I had the right to do so, nor did I hear a voice, a promise from a pearly place. I did it dumb and owe you 50 bucks. Thank you. <coughs> Thank you. <coughs> Thank you. 
just got through that. Um, all right, that was wonderful. Let's give him a round of applause. Thank you. Um, I think Tom said he'd be kind enough to answer some questions. So is there any questions for Tom? Almost always has to be a teacher who asks the, asks guess, the first sorry. question. <laughs> Where do you get your titles from? <coughs> when I was very little, my father dropped me on my head, <laughs> and just something went wrong. And uh, it just started going that way. Uh, sometimes I invent them completely. Sometimes like that permissibility of eating uh, 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 mermaids, that was from a history book that I was reading. Uh, they come from different <coughs> places. Uh, sometimes they're very simple, but I believe that that's where the writer's responsibility begins. The poet's responsibility to the reader begins with the title. We have a, a responsibility to uh, <coughs> engage the reader, to not be boring, to make them want to read the poem. And that, that begins with the, uh, the title. I like, to, uh, I like to think I try to write poems that are hard not to read rather than poems that are hard to read. Uh, so I want to, uh, the reader matters to me and I don't want to bore them. Uh, so, yeah. Does that mean you always come up with a title first? Or have <coughs> not always, but uh, <coughs> fairly frequently. Lots of my poems do kind of come off the title. I do often get the title first and then it's a title that, or, or a, something uh, that either I pops in my head or I read, that strikes me as having metaphorical possibilities uh, uh, that that I want to explore. Where where is this going to take me? Where is this going to go? What can, what I, what my, what might I discover if I if I examine uh, whatever it was that struck me about that that title or that phrase or that uh, word coupling? Uh, so often they do start like that. Yeah from a title. Yes? I'm just curious. Um, I'm really just learning about poetry, literally. I'm like the 40-year-old freshman here at Bookdale. <coughs> I'm just wondering, how do you, how do, you do your the breaks? Do you change them often, or do you already have them? Oh, no. I, I work on them uh, uh, relentlessly and doggedly. Anything I read tonight was, it took at least 15 drafts to write. Uh, 20, 25, 30 is not unusual. And that's always at at least a period, over a period of weeks, uh, often more commonly months and, uh, and sometimes even years. Uh, so, uh, uh, what do you base it on? Is it just what you want to say or is it how it's flowing? Or? Uh, it's, I'm trying to discover something. I'm trying to discover what I want to say. I never know what I want to say when I start a poem. It's the poems, Robert Frost said, poems begin like a lump in the throat, a sense of homesickness or lovesickness. Something just strikes you and, and nags at you that you have to try to, uh, for me anyway, that I have to try to explore it, try to discover what that, uh, that, what that thing is. Uh, Robert Frost again said, no discovery for the writer, no discovery for the reader, meaning if you don't discover something you didn't know you felt or thought about the subject while you're writing the poem, the reader's not going to make any discoveries when uh, they, they read uh, the poem. So it's supposed to end up sounding like it's just some guy talking. And, uh, but for me anyway, to make it sound that way, I have to pretty much sweat blood and it, has to, and it takes a long time. It's creating an illusion, just like an, an actor. If you notice an actor is, reading, uh, is acting, then they're not acting uh, well. When you're reading a novel, you're supposed to not, you're not supposed to be thinking, I'm reading a novel. You're supposed to be just lost in the story. Uh, but to make that happen, or to try to make that happen, I have to, I have to work hard. Yeah? I assume you've had more than one poem going on at the same time. I do, usually. The most I ever had was 20, and that was in that group of poems, those 23 line poems. I started them all together. Uh, but I do do that. I do tend to work in batches because I'll do a draft on one and then I'll, I'll just move on to the next one on that same day. And I actually work very methodically. I'll say if I have six poems that I've started at the same time, I, I number them 
Uh, and I'll do a draft on one, a draft on two, a draft on three, four, five, six, and then go back to the beginning. I'll never do a second draft on two until I've done the second draft. I just go cyclically. I write, I usually write in notebooks. I have one note dr draft on one side, uh, and then I, I write the new draft on the other side, and then after I have uh, enough drafts like that, I, I type it up. Uh, uh, on the computer now, and then I do drafts on the TypeScript, and I use different colored inks uh, for like four different drafts where I, where I write on the TypeScript revisions, and then I do another TypeScript draft in which I incorporate those uh, revisions. Uh, it's about the only thing in my life I do in any kind of seriously orderly uh, or, or uh, uh, you know, meticulous manner is, uh, is the process of writing. And I look at it as a job. It's my job. It has nothing to do, there's nothing glamorous about it. Inspiration has relatively little uh, to do with it. You have to feel something and feel something intensely, but I like to think the way you honor, f being able to feel something, anything, is a gift. Is a, it's better than numbness. Any kind of feeling is better than uh, numbness. And uh, I like to think that uh, the way you honor feeling something, the way you, you show respect to that is by giving it your attention, your, your, your work, your, uh, your time, your energy. I read somewhere recently, I can't quite say it, I can't remember who said it, maybe Pascal, that uh, 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 attention, close attention is the, is, is, the, is the natural prayer of the common man. Giving our focus, giving our attention to something we love is a kind of a, a natural kind of uh, prayer. Uh, for, for regular, maybe non-religious people. Yeah? Going through so many drafts, how do you know when to let go? Uh, just, I used to answer that with the most common quote out that the poems, I think it was Paul Valéry who said, poems never get finished, they only get abandoned. But uh, I actually <laughs> got the nerve to, to say, uh, uh, I finish my poems, or I finish them as best I can. and. Uh, uh, when I know that, I, I don't know. It's just when it's, you just had enough of it, and the next one is calling you, and you think it's, you think it's pretty much done. That's all. Yeah? Would you choose a subject to write about? Well, there's only two subjects in all of art and all of literature. Uh, love and death, those are the only two subjects they are. Everything else is a variation under, the, on those two, uh, under those two two subjects. And I don't mean, when I say death, I don't mean that morbidly. Uh, 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 even writing about or uh, thinking about uh, the, our mortality is a, is a positive, affirmative act. It's an act of uh, uh, writing, making anything, any act of creation is an affirmative act and it comes out of uh, the life force. So even if you're writing a poem that's a sad or, or about the terrible cruelties uh, that human beings inflict upon each other, I still look at that as a positive uh, uh, thing. Uh, any kind of act of creation is against uh, that inevitability. Love, of course, is just an incredible mystery. And uh, uh, we, we know even less about that than we do death, I think. And uh, so that is, those are the two subjects. I mean, I, you could show me virtually any poem ever written and I could, I could pretty much fit them under one of those two headings and often um, under both of them at the same time. Yeah? When did you know you wanted to become a writer? I think in, in, in kind of high school, I started fantasizing about being a writer because I love to read. And uh, that's the only reason anybody ever becomes a writer, because they love to read. And, uh, but I had no idea that even such a thing as contemporary poetry existed. As far as I knew, every poet in the world was dead in 1945, because that's when the textbooks, the high school English textbooks, ended. Uh, but uh, when I got to college, uh, I had a real poet for a teacher, a woman named Helen Chasen, and I discovered uh, contemporary poetry uh, then. Poetry that was speaking in the language we speak today, uh, and, uh, and that changed my, my life. Uh, dozens and dozens of poets have influenced me, and I have imitated and learned from uh, over the years. I'll just mention a handful of the American uh, 20th century. Hart Crane, uh, Theodore Retke, John Berryman, Elizabeth uh, Bishop, Adrian Rich, uh, uh, dozens and, and dozens of poets. Uh, uh, that's how you learn. Um, uh, sometimes people say, I, once in a while you hear a student say, oh, I don't like to read that much. I don't want to interfere with my style. Uh, uh, 
that's a kind of frightening thing to hear uh, for, for a writing teacher. My answer usually is, uh, well, in fact, you don't have a style yet, and if you read and read and read, you might develop your own style, uh, but, uh, but you don't uh, now. But uh, lots and lots of uh, poets. Uh, and I can look back on early poems and th see things that I lifted uh, from other poets, uh, uh, usually almost always unconsciously. Uh, but if that doesn't happen, uh, when I see a young poet and, uh, and, and I can't tell who they've been reading or what poets they love, uh, they're not reading enough. They're not, they're, they haven't read enough. Uh, they haven't thought about it uh, enough. Uh, so it's okay to be influenced. Uh, it's in fact necessary to be influenced to, and to even imitate uh, other artists that you love, either consciously or unconsciously. It'll happen unconsciously. If you love, if you love a poet, it's gonna happen. Any other questions? Yeah. Um, what category does your poem tactile fall under? Love poem. Love? love poem, yeah. I mean, a love poem of a kind of broken-hearted love poem because the, 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 the beloved isn't there anymore and all he has left are the little scars from uh, her eyelash on his rib cage, but that's a love poem, yeah, sure. Most love poems are not, I love you, I love you, they're, they're like, you know, broken-hearted love poems, yeah. What inspired you to start writing in the first place? Reading. Reading, loving to read, and, uh, and just wanting to try to do that at some point. Uh, yeah. Do you have a favorite poem of yours that you've written? I don't really. Uh, I have maybe a half a dozen or so that I think are, uh, are pretty good, uh, that I like. They're usually not the poems that are, uh, tend to be more popular with, with other people, but I don't have an individual poem. That would be like having, I only have one child, but if I had two children, I wouldn't have a favorite. They would both be, uh, or three or four. Uh, but I only have one, uh, so I don't have that problem with, with children. But it's the same kind of principle, uh, I think. Any other questions? Yeah, dude? Uh, when you write a poem, do you like, do it sort of like spontaneously? Like you'll see something that inspires you and you have to write one like right there? No, no, I, I said a little while ago, were you taking a nap or something, dude? <laughs> uh, uh, I work on them for weeks and months and over and over again, and it might start on one day, but I rarely even get a bad first draft in one, one sitting. I have to sit down and work about five different times just to get a bad first draft. Uh, so no, it's never spontaneous for me. I wish it would be sometimes. That'd be neat. That'd be, that'd be great. That, that would be, if you could write a good poem at a stroke, that would be great. But in fact, that has virtually never happened in the history of art, in the history of literature, and even the few examples, like Kublai Khan, Coleridge, you know, he's supposedly taking an, an opium nap, and a guy from Porlock comes and knocks on the door, and, uh, and all he can remember afterwards is uh, that fragment uh, that we have, Kublai Khan, a great, great uh, poem. It was supposed to be a 300-line poem. Most likely, that's not what happened. Coleridge was a junkie and an alky. Uh, do they ever lie? Uh, junkies and elkies ever lie about stuff like that or anything? Everything else Coleridge wrote, he wrote uh, uh, with painstaking care uh, over a period of weeks and months. Robert Frost did write that little poem, uh, Stopping by the Woods, uh, at a stroke, as he said. But it too was revised. I've seen the papers. There are some changes on it. It's a little poem. And when he wrote that poem, he had been eating, sleeping, breathing, reading, writing poetry every single day of his life for 50 years or so. So the gods of poetry said to him, here's one for you. You earned this. Uh, you know, <laughs> maybe you get a, a gift like that once in a while. But great art doesn't just happen. Uh, great art is made. It uh, doesn't just come down your, your arm. Uh, you, have to, uh, you have to work for it. You have to work at it, uh, just like anything. We think writing, because we all have language uh, and we all have feelings, we know what poems look like. We think we would never s feel the same way about if we loved to, wanted to play the violin. I mean, you know goddamn well you can't pick up the violin and, and just play it beautifully. Uh, or you can't do that with a piano, or you can't sing, you can't paint. People go to classes to learn how to paint. They take dance lessons, they take all kinds of lessons. Uh, but sometimes we think because, you know, language, I know what a poem looks like, I can do that. Uh, uh, yeah, you can, but, but it's an art form, it's a craft, it's something you get better at if you love it and you practice just like, just like anything. Uh, I hope that wasn't too discouraging. 
Busy. Oh, two, two more. This guy in the red shirt back there? You could use a little haircut, dude. Do a little haircut. I'll do it after the reading for you. What? No, I think no soul saved after about this time. Uh, uh, but uh, that, no, that's, 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 enough, uh, that's enough reading. But thank you for asking. That's nice. What's your, this will be the last question. Um, what's the significance of your title in relation to your poems? The book titles? Yeah, the book titles. OK. Uh, it's not an actual poem. <coughs> You know what? That title of that book, The Cradle Place, just kind of popped into my head as I was driving through my hometown one day. Uh, and it's just meant to indicate a, a beginning place uh, uh, where something is set and you grow up from. Uh, that's about, about all with that title. It doesn't have anything to do with any particular poem in the book or any particular theme, except the theme of kind of something getting started. And uh, that's where you grow from, the, the, the cradle. Thank you very much. It was great. Great for you to come. Thank you very much. <coughs>